which is great. Except these are all very, these are traditional fabrication techniques, um, but a lot of the world around us isn't necessarily um, using these types of fabrication methods. So particularly when we think about personal physicalizations, let's think about data in our everyday lives. How do we go beyond um, these digital fabrication platforms and potentially think about um, things that aren't necessarily made out of wood, metal, or plastic? Um, so this is where we start to depart into Laura's sabbatical thinking land. Um, if you look around us, a lot of the things we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis in our personal lives are textiles. So think about the clothes that you wear, um, the upholstery that's on all of the furniture, the curtains that are surrounding us right now. Um, these are all sort of soft everyday objects. And if you're thinking about, you know, how can we put data into 3D printed plastic objects, we may as well be thinking about how we can um, complete that space by thinking about um, these more alternative formats. There's a bunch of different ways you can think about textiles. We can think about weaving. We can think about needle felting. Although today, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about embroidery, knitting, and crochet. These are three areas that I've, I've spent some time thinking about. So first on embroidery. Um, embroidery is sort of the art of uh, using needle and thread to sew in forms on top of um, fabric, often as sort of a, an afterthought decoration. And what's cool about embroidery is there are embroidery machines. This you can computationally control. It has its limits, but you can get an embroidery machine to help you. However, to understand why this gets hard and annoying, you have to first step back and think about how that embroidery machine gets its instructions. So um, if you aren't familiar with G-Code, G-Code is a standardized machine language um, that's universal for most CNC mills and 3D printers. I describe it as the Incredible Hulk shouting at a 3D printer. Um, it's very crude language, so this is an example. 1000, T1, M6, G90, G40, G21, G17, G94, G80. That's why it's called G-Code. Um, G54, and then it starts giving you XY coordinates. So while this is relatively crude, you have to be thankful that there is such a thing as G-Code because it's universal for like most CNC mills and 3D printers. You can give, in theory, the same G-Code to, uh, to something that cuts as something that extrudes, and in theory, it will run the same G-Code. Might not do very well, but in theory, it would run. Embroidery machines, however, uh, each manufacturer has decided to have their own proprietary file format, which means that if I try to have my, you know, in my lab we have a FAF Creative, in this lab um, you guys have an Epic. If I try to generate a file and pass it to you, you can't read it because those machines speak fundamentally different languages. It is infuriating. Um, you can buy software that will let you take a more universal file format like an SVG um, and translate that to your local machine. However, there's a, lot, there's a lot more within that SVG converter that you might want to play with. So thinking about how do you control texture on a lower level? How do you control stitch directionality? Um, these sorts of things might actually be of interest to us if we want to create a visualization. So if you think about it, what is a stitch if not a vector? It has a position, it has an orientation, and we can actually sew fields of stitches, if you will, to create a flow field if we wanted to. Um, taking an image like this, and passing it to an SVG um, importer may or may not work the way you think it will um, on the machine itself. So thinking about lower level tools is, is kind of interesting because there, there's some interesting potential from within that. So I had this undergraduate student, Kendra, who now is working with Wes on her master's, um, but for her undergraduate thesis, she was thinking about exactly this issue. So um, Kendra went back to the embroidery machine and said, well, there's only really one stitch, but depending on how you um, go about that stitch, there's a bunch of different ways that you can create new effects. So there's the straight stitch, the satin stitch, and the fill stitch. Um, so building off of stitch code, which is a, I think, I believe it's a Swiss um, research group has created this and is using it to teach kids how to create a, an embroidery machine, sort of like Turtle back in the day. Um, so she's created an add-on for this to sort of allow more types of um, more types of rendering so that you can start to do things like this. This is a visualization of a run that she did um, using all three types of stitches. The sort of envisioned use case for this is you've run a race, it's a 10K, they give you the free jersey, um, and then after you've completed running your race, you can give them your jersey and they could you know, actually add an embroidered visualization of how you did during that race um, onto your jersey. So now you've taken a sort of 
you know, hundreds of copies of this jersey and made something personal that might represent you and this one race and create a more effective memory. So um, for this poster, she's actually talking about a different embroidered that she created, um, which is sort of a embroidered blanket um, that represents a SMS thread that she and her boyfriend had. Um, and it's really cool. Uh, so basically what she did is she took a bunch of SMS messages between her and her boyfriend, um, and she ran it through Watson to figure out what's the emotionality of, of the various messages. Um, so that's sort of the bars. You can see his messages and her messages. Um, and then the, the neat thing too is on the side with white thread on white fabric, she has the keywords of those messages. Um, so from a distance, you get one impression, but up close, you have a very different um, impression. So this is really just thinking about, okay, if we can now embroider data, what are the ways that we can apply the different types of personal objects to make um, more meaningful personal items? So that's on embroidery. Let's talk a little bit about knitting. Um, out of curiosity, who in the group has heard of Thingiverse? Hopefully most everyone. Almost everyone. Okay, Thingiverse is an online repository of for the most part, I have a paper talking about the weird things in Fit Thingiverse, but for the most part, 3D printable files that you can download um, with minor modification, chuck in your 3D printer and print a thing. Um, I quite recommend the Second Life mug, by the way. It's mm -hmm. very lovely. Um, there's many reasons why I like it as a design. So what Thingiverse is to 3D printing, Ravelry is to knitting and crochet. Um, and back when I was looking at this more more in detail in 2015, Ravelry was like an order of magnitude larger than Thingiverse. So not only do you have patterns, but you also have people posting projects. So each instance that they sort of interpret that pattern at home as their own project, they'll post that on Ravelry as well. So what's really awesome about Ravelry is you get a, a very good slice of kind of the design space of all of the crazy things you can do with yarn. And they have, um, and it, it's, it really runs the gamut. You can poke through and find I mean, like baby buddy elf part one. Like you can find really crazy things here. Um, but one of the things that you also can find are temperature blankets and temperature scarves. Um, so some of the earlier posts on temperature blankets and temperature scarves that are like increasing popularity were in like 2013 or so. Um, and the whole idea is that you take a data set, you take temperature at your location and you render that in a knit scarf. You can also crochet it, but we'll talk about crochet later. Um, so from poking at these, just on a high level, we can start to ask, what do, these, what do these blankets and scarves have in common? So step one, you have to get your temperature data. Um, and there's wonderful blog posts that people have added on exactly how they're doing this. How they're, you know, what website are you going to to get your temperature data? How are you keeping track of that temperature data so that you can then you know, add it into your pattern accurately? Um, we also have data encoding. I don't know if it's because knitters love rainbows or because weather maps love rainbow color schemes, um, but there's a lot of rainbows here. Um, but you see that the mapping is always a little different between different people's projects. Um, so there is always this step of, okay, I have a box full of yarn and these are the different temperature ranges that I need to, that I can represent using this. Um, actually, one of my favorite ones over here is actually crocheted, but they're trying to represent not only the temperature, but also whether or not there's the, the high temperature, the low temperature, and precipitation, which is super cool. Um, and you don't have to do a rainbow. You can pick another spectrum if you want. So um, this made by DeVries um, knitter actually has purples and blacks instead of your typical rainbow. And then we have to start thinking about how are we going to segment this data? Um, so oftentimes this comes down to the structure of the blanket or the structure of the scarf. Um, so if it's a blanket, oftentimes each square is one data point, and as you go through additional squares, those are additional data points. But if you're doing something like a scarf, that would be a really long scarf, because you would, in theory, have 365 squares all in one giant row. Um, so oftentimes you'll instead have um, you know, one row or two rows that will be striped with a color pattern determined by what the temperature was for that day. So this is an uh, interesting sort of real world example that's been widely adopted of basically data knitting. Um, but it's actually just the tip of an iceberg. There's a lot of different ways we can think about encoding data within knitting. And this is where my handy dandy little presentation prop will come in handy. Um, 
which I will start passing around just to get that moving. Um, so the first thing to think about is the gauge. So any knitter who's doing things properly, which don't always do things properly, will first knit a gauge swatch. So it's a swatch to first get a sense of how many stitches per inch or rows per inch um, you're producing. And that helps make sure that whatever you're going to produce will be accurate to the pattern that you're reading. At the end of the day, the gauge is relative to the needle size, the yarn weight, and the tension. The tension is literally in your hands how much tension you have as you knit. Are you, are you knitting things tightly? Are you knitting things loosely? Um, so if you do a gauge, you can say, oh, I'll use larger needles. Oh, I'll use, um, I'll use a heavier, lighter yarn. So I get the right stitches per inch or rows per inch. Which means if we wanted to, we could, um, it's a little odd to think about, but you could think about how you can encode data through that gauge. It's a little less predictable because a gauge is actually the sum of those three parts. But we can also think about yarn qualities. So obviously we can map to color. We've seen examples of that in temperature scarves. We also have what kind of fiber. You could imagine a monochromatic scarf that actually is encoding the temperature using silk, using wool, using bamboo, using cotton. Um, you can think about the weight, so that's the thickness of the, of the yarn itself. Um, and this is a, a trippy one, but arguably in that valid domain. You can think about the provenance. You can say, okay, I know that this is coming from this country, so every time I, have, I visit a new country, I will use yarn from that country um, in my scarf or in my garment. Um, you can even get down to, I have my friend's pet sheep, and every, like I have a 4-H sheep every year, and every time we shear the sheep and get yarn, I will have you know, the sweater that represents all of the sheep. Um, the other part of this that gets real interesting is pattern geometry. So yarn qualities is sort of looking at the material itself. Pattern geometry is looking at the resulting um, thing that's being produced. Um, we can get into way more detail later, but you can think about whether or not you use a knit or a purl stitch. Um, but increasing and decreasing, so the number of stitches you have in a given row or for a given measurement. Um, we can think about lace work and open work. So in that swatch that I have, I have sub, a couple of pearl stitches here and I have some open work thrown in there so you can see what that looks like. You can also do crazy things like cabling. You can add beads. Um, and really there's a ton of different knitting techniques, all of which you could use to help indicate um, a data point or a data value. This is still kind of sketching out what that design space might be. However, if you go back to Ravelry and you look at these patterns, they're patterns. They, they like to be regular, they like to be consistent, they like to be um, symmetrical wherever possible. So you start looking through Alvary and there's not as much in the realm of random designs or asymmetrical designs. So trying to figure out, okay, if I, if I want to design for data, how do I design something that can withstand um, some of the noise that you'll get with data ultimately? Um, so these are actually two examples I pulled from Ravelry. This one is random bobbles, which actually looks like a scatter plot. This is just based on a random set of numbers that were generated. Actually, I forget, I, yeah, I believe this is a random set of numbers, although some of it comes down to any time they ran out of yarn, they would just make a bobble, switch yarn, keep going. Um, the NACL ring there in the corner is actually um, a knit using dice. So the pattern says get dice, cast on stitches, roll dice. After however many stitches the dice tells you to go, create a uh, lace work. So create an open, an open hole there. Um, so you can also find patterns for random lace, which are very strange compared to most typical lace patterns, which are usually quite structured. So these are sort of the, some of the things I've been thinking about with, with knitting with data. Um, obviously, I've pulled some, some knitting needles and some yarn here that I've been playing with. Um, back at my home research lab, I don't have a knitterate. This is my like dream knitting machine. Um, what I currently have is a Brother 930E, which is a 1990s vintage um, knitting machine that actually can do some very low level control. Um, but we can start to think about um, digital fabrication with knitting as well. So these are all issues that we can potentially explore in a more automated fashion. So that was knitting. Let's go on to crochet. Um, so crochet and knitting are, have some very important differences. Um, I have the animated GIF here just so you can appreciate for what crochet looks like in action. Crochet Knitting has needles, crochet has hooks. Um, to date, no robot has learned how to crochet yet. I'm not gonna like bet against the robots, 
Um, but crochet is really hard to do automatically because it requires you to read the work. You have to know where you are in, in the structure because you only have one, one stitch, one connection to the rest of what you have. Um, as a result, you can make some pretty crazy amazing stuff. So over here is an animated GIF once again, so you can appreciate the structure of this protein that has been crocheted. Um, you can end up with really cool freeform structures with crochet simply because it has um, so few rules associated with it. That said, there are some and you can actually do some pretty interesting stuff with obviously, um, with some patterns. So this is from uh, Woolly Thoughts, but there's a bunch of people who are doing this technique, which is hyperbolic crochet. So a mathematician back around the late 90s, early 2000s, um, realized that she could teach hyperbolic surfaces really well. She just talks about it through a crochet pattern. So she would get her students to crochet as a way of teaching what these types of surfaces are like. What happens when things are no longer planar and we get into you know, constantly increasing circles? Well, you get into these kind of crazy curly forms. Um, what I'm really curious about is uh, if you start to look at the charts for these types of patterns, it looks something like this, which to me looks a lot like a phylogenetic tree. Um, and so what I'm uh, sort of inspired by is um, thinking about what happens when the data, the structure of the data itself becomes the instructions for these types of artifacts. Um, so one of my to-do list items for my sabbatical is to think about and play with um, what happens if I try to crochet a phylogenetic tree. Will it turn out interesting? Where will it fail? I'm expecting it to fail, but I'm really curious to find out where it will actually break down. So that's all my, my thoughts thus far on data physicalization. So let's switch gears a bit um, to interaction in maker spaces. So hopefully everyone's familiar with maker spaces and fabrication spaces. It's a hot topic. We see them a lot, of course, here in an architecture school, um, increasingly in communities, in libraries, in people's garages. Um, the HCI community has turned their attention towards maker spaces and fabrication in a pretty serious way in the last couple of years. Um, and fortunately, thinking about how we can potentially interact with fabrication a little bit differently, which I love. This is wonderful. Um, so Christian Weichel and, and co-authors um, presented MixFab, which is thinking about how we can use mixed reality to, um, to change how we interact with fabric, personal fabrication and get more information about the design that we're trying to create or instructions on how to create it. Um, and then from uh, uh, Autodesk Research, they also pitch the idea of a smart maker space. So what happens if you're in this space and you have um, physical tools and, and uh, digital fabrication machines, but then you also have this large surface that can offer you information about what exactly is going on in this instrumented space. These things are super cool. They're sort of making this assumption though, the assumption that we've got you know, a relatively knowledgeable person who's carefully looking over their one 3D printer in a relatively pristine environment, which is great. But in reality, maker spaces are a whole lot more chaotic um, and have a whole lot more variance in it. So this is a, a photo from the Citrus Invention Lab back at UC Berkeley. Um, and in this particular picture, this is a, uh, in an architecture school, you might call this, a, it's like if you fused a studio with a workshop. So it has 3D printers, both high end and low end. It's got a laser cutter that we're probably standing right next to in this, in this photograph. Um, Electronics benches, it sort of has the full, full gamut of things. So instead of thinking of one person, one 3D printer, one design, um, thinking about maker spaces in this context actually is a lot more complicated. Um, so this slide has my asterisk of this is a thought in process. Um, so if we're thinking about these of, of maker spaces as ecosystems, we have to think about tools in a different way. So we've got digital tools and we have hand tools and we have multiple machine workflows. We don't just have making things, we also have assembling things. Um, and then if you step back, you also have to maintain and keep up all of those tools. So if something breaks down, you have to somehow fix it or maintain it. Um, when we're thinking about people, we've got a lot of people. Sometimes they're not always there at the same time. Sometimes everyone decides to show up all at once. So how do you manage um, varying demand? Um, you've got a range of expertise, you've got newcomers, but you also have people who are leaving and that actually represents a, a departure of knowledge, not just yet another person who's faded out. From a process perspective, there are um, sort of 
there are rituals that you go through in a makerspace. So like I've done this, thank you, Elliot. I did this uh, very recently in Sensalab, the okay, let's, let's get you safety trained and make sure you don't set anything on fire or hurt yourself. Um, there's machine training. If you're not familiar with how to use a machine or the particular way you're supposed to use this particular instance of a machine. Um, there's how do you keep things tidy so it's usable by other people. Um, and there's things like if you run out of filament, what happens? Who replaces the filament in that machine? Who orders new filament? And then from a management perspective, which I'm sure is very familiar with, how do you justify that allocation of resources? How do you say, this is a space and worth investing in, this is equipment worth investing in, um, this is why this space is important and this is what it's produced? Um, and ideally, you're trying to avoid a tragedy of the commons. This is all for like a very healthy makerspace. Um, the makerspaces I've been involved with at Calgary are both relatively young and a very different beast because I'm dealing with a ghost town a little bit. Um, so this is Garage 142 at the University of Calgary. It's the computer science makerspace that the department set up. Um, and it's basically available for undergraduate and graduate students in computer science and CMD. There's no specific research lab affiliated with it. There's no specific courses that are affiliated with it. Um, and it was sort of set up with this ethos of, if you build it, they will come. This was, not, this was what I inherited. The, we have a space. People will use the space, because there's a space now. Um, which is a lovely thought, but in practice, I'm wondering who exactly is that they, and why are they showing up? Um, you might end up with a ghost town because it's unclear who's allowed to use that space and motivation for why they should show up. Um, so there's, there's these types of challenges that can easily also occur. You can have a 3D printer in a library, but why, why are people going to come to that library to 3D print? Are they 3D printing in the library because the architecture workshop down the hall has not enough capacity and therefore they're over any 3D printer or laser cutter they can find? Something to consider. Um, another important distinction is teaching spaces versus research spaces. So you know this very well. At Sensei Lab, you have the research fab lab side of the house, and there's the teaching workshop side of the house. Um, back at Calgary, this is my research fab lab. Um, this was from about a year ago, and I had a student take a picture of what it looks like now, similar-ish, but there's new furniture and a whole lot of other things that showed up and lots of messy projects going on. Um, so figuring out, you know, who's, you know, who's in charge of this space. What happens when I ha when new students show up to this space? What happens when somebody wants to use a machine? What happens when one wants to use the same machine? Um, all of these issues are still needing to be dealt with, even within this small research space. And practically speaking, um, while I can help fund this space and I can help support this space, I'm not an expert in this space because my experts are my students, and if I do my job, they will graduate. So figuring out how to keep some longevity can be a challenge. So there's all of these practical questions that you have to deal with if you're actually trying to keep a makerspace up and running and alive. So while on sabbatical, I'm visiting makerspaces and figuring out kind of the answer to a lot of these questions, which in this case, you have Elliot. Mm -hmm. and the lesson is do not underestimate the value of an Elliot. Um, a lab manager is a luxury, let me tell you. As somebody who who wishes she had a proper lab manager. I have um, a student who's been volunteering in Garage 142 out of the goodness of his heart. Um, he first approached me because he fell in love with my knitting machine and he normally does like hardcore applied math graphics research and he wants, he wants to play around with something that's nothing like what he does for research. I've tried to convince him like you could publish in HCI but he wants to keep his, his hobbies separate from his professional life. So. Good on him. As long as he likes to lace, we're fine. Um, but that's a volunteer student who's not my student, who I am very conscientious about asking too much of him because he's not my student and this is not his research. And so having somebody like an Elliot is wonderful because if we go back to all of these questions, if you, if you wanted to figure out the answer to any of these questions, you know who you would ask. It's pretty clear who you would ask. And if Elliot doesn't know the answer, it's his job to figure out the answer and to make sure that the next time somebody asks this question, he has an answer for things like, um, how are consumables managed? Or where does in-progress work live? If this ever becomes an issue, it's sort of his job to make sure that it's taken care of properly and things can properly. 
<coughs> so then, then this begs the question, what happens if there's no Elliot around? And this could be like a, a far off someday in the future, Elliot will decide that he wants to like, I don't know, go live in a tree house and you know, frolic or something. That day far in the future, or it could be, you know, it's a weekend and Elliot does not work weekends and you're sitting in an empty space trying to figure out like, oh God, there's a weird smell. And it, what happened? Like, who was using this flag? Like, eh, I need more information about what just happened because my institutional memory is no longer present. Um, which is where we can step back and think about these maker spaces, not just as, um, as places where we make things, but places where um, data just keeps popping out whether we want them to or not. So if we go around the room here, we've got a project display case which shows you past projects. If someone's wondering, okay, why should I, why should I continue to space as the department head, I can say, oh, look at our project display case where you can see student work from classes that have used this space. We have a fancy 3D printer which has a list of jobs and a list of people who know how to use the fancy 3D printer. Um, we also have not so fancy 3D printers, which for most people is what you want to be guiding them towards. Um, so there's a potential to sort of look at who, who are the experts, but when is it appropriate to use one over the other? We have the consumable inventory in the back. Um, in Sensolab, you have a badass inventory system that I would love if it were on GitHub. Um, <laughs> but I also sort of wonder what would happen if you started looking at the underlying data that's being generated from that inventory system? Who are your heavy users? Who are the experts? Because they keep on taking the range finders. Somebody, somebody's figuring out with range finders. Who is that person the next time someone, uh, a student comes in for a temporary basis and wants to know, you know, where did all the range finders go? Or who knows about range finders? Um, there's also a door badge reader, which doesn't apply to Sensolab, but applies to Garage 142. We have card key access. Who's using the space and when? It's a ghost town, but for all I know, that picture was taken at um, you know, a, a particular lull on you know, a Friday morning. But it could be that everybody's coming through after class at 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. to use the space. Um, so understanding uh, the door badge reader could tell you a little bit more about um, what the temporal patterns are in the space. And therefore, when you might want to have somebody like a lab manager show up. So even if the lab manager hasn't quite figured out what to do, you know, how do you best allocate his time and his and his knowledge. That lab manager, by the way, is my brother, Mark. He's great. He does not work there anymore. But, yes. <coughs> so if we think of makerspaces as more than just um, fabrication workshops, but places where data is being prolifically produced, um, there's some benefit not only in design, but also in management of the space. Um, perhaps we can think about how we can use that data and leverage that data to improve how people create things, but also how that space is managed properly. And with that, thank you. Ask me questions. Shoot. Perfect, thank you, it was a great talk. It's actually it felt like a It kind of was. It was great how you slipped in three talks mm -hmm. into one question. But, um, so apart from wondering why nobody puts windows in buildings in Canada, uh, I guess my real question was, um, uh, that was a joke, sorry. Uh, <laughs> we do, they're just very small. Yeah, yeah. So I think that the first part of your, or the second part of your talk really, which was about the data physicalization. Mm -hmm. So it's, I think back uh, a couple of years ago, there was this, this whole sort of movement in design about data beautification, mm -hmm. about making data beautiful mm -hmm. that would make people want to actually understand it. Mm -hmm. And so I guess this, this whole idea of, of using craft technology to try and understand data, I'm kind of curious as to how you see it sort of fitting into traditional craft activities and what, what makes it different. Why, why would people, I mean apart from the personalization aspect, like I can wear a scarf and someone says that's a really cool scarf and say mm -hmm. oh it's actually the temperature data for the last hundred Mm -hmm. years and that's a really great conversation starter and mm -hmm. you know, it kind of says something about you like you're concerned about the temperature mm -hmm. and all that stuff. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about yeah. you know, where would this go in the longer term? So there's, there's two pieces to that. One which I've been racking my brain about a little bit is um, data sculpture versus data, other forms of data physicalization. Mm -hmm. um, so like you'll see artists who are doing data sculptures so they're saying I will take this data and use the aesthetic of the data to create this form. 
um, that form might not be too readable or interpretable in a meaningful way unless you have the title that says, you know, climate change between these years. But the actual mapping, what the values are, you won't be able to, to read that as much as get a much more um, emotional story from it. So it's, it's interesting to think about the role that data sculpture has versus um, some of the examples I'm bringing up here, which are a little bit more um, on the personal and everyday side. So I feel like some of the you know, crocheted phylogenetic tree is more likely to end up in this category of data sculpture, where conceptually it's very interesting, but pragmatically it is not, not very readable, not, not quite as meaningful. Um, thinking about things that are slightly more readable, um, I feel like there's some interesting bits um, when it comes to uh, uh, concealing data, if that makes sense. So if you have a personal mapping, I can tell you, oh, this is a temperature scarf, but you might not necessarily know where it's a temperature scarf from, what the data value ranges are, unless I choose to disclose that to you. Um, so there's some interesting implications there. Um, I feel like there's interesting implications broad, more broadly in design when it comes to customization, though, because we always think about, like, oh, how do we customize, how do we, how do we tailor things to our bodies, how do we customize um, objects or customize products to give you a more unique experience. So if I said, um, you know, I could give you um, a set of coffee cups, and each coffee cup represents a paper that the Sensor Lab has produced over the years, and you have this beautiful coffee cup collection. Um, means that you have this unique set of artifacts that, that in many ways represents the Sensi Lab. You might be a little more distraught if one of them breaks, but it also would mean that you have sort of more of a, an object of pride. So it, it's interesting to think about um, beyond the it's an interesting story, what that kind of represents in the person's life, and also what the, the greater value might be of that. Is so making cultural value of something mm -hmm. that is not really necessarily important to me? Yeah, well, and, and that's sort of the other kind of crazy thing. I'll hop back to this randomness issue, is that um, if you look at, so actually this is an example. I picked this because it was called topography cowl. I was trying to look on Ravelry to see if anybody has done um, like maps, for example, using knitting, because this is just you know ridge patterns that you can create with some level of control and some level of resolution. Um, it's like you can, you can start to think about how um, these artifacts look if it's being very structured. If you have a pattern and it has a very constant, um, a constant uh, texture to it, has a, a very um, recognizable aesthetic. It looks like waves. It looks like ridges. It looks like stripes. Whereas these kind of, it gets into a very almost, it almost feels postmodern, but I, I mean, even from the talk yesterday, when you see more generated forms, there's a certain aesthetic that you get from data-driven forms. Um, so things like, if I didn't tell, like this is actually not data, it's completely random, but it has an aesthetic to it, similarly with the random lace. So all of a sudden, if I told you, oh, this is a scatter plot with data, um, does that change how you view the artifact? Um, it's also f interesting to think about um, the extent to which real data has randomness versus you know, curves and patterns and trends that we ascribe to it. Um, so I feel like different data will also result in very different s aesthetics underneath it. Um, if I were to take seismic noise, for example, that's going to be very different from uh, overall temperature trends if I'm trying to smooth it out a little bit more into a curve. I, th I think the other thing uh, that it really adds is the whole thing about understanding something through practice. <laughs> So we, we did a couple of, last year we had Margaret Wertheim come and gave a talk because she does all the crochet hyperbolic mm -hmm. surfaces and stuff. And um, I think f like she sort of reflected on the fact that it's actually the process of doing it, it gives you a level of understanding mm -hmm. and maybe familiarity with the data that enables those conversations yeah. to actually happen. Whereas if you're just looking at it on a screen and the screen switches off or disappears and you walk away, mm -hmm. You don't have the same sort of intimacy with the, um, yeah. with the thing that you're building. Well, and, and I've thought about that when it comes to the knitting machine. So the Knitterate machine is pretty much, you set it and forget it. Like you say, here's my pattern, go, and yeah. it prints it out. Um, my 930E is just smart enough to kind of help, but also pretty dumb. Like it can't do a lot of these variables that I've been talking about. So it, it, it can't purl, which is pretty fundamental, but it, it just can't. It can't purl, it can't cable, it can't uh, 
increase or decrease, a lot of these things actually do require manual intervention, um, which is where I sort of see hybrid fabrication approaches as having um, a huge potential. It's the equivalent of saying, um, instead of saying, like, so currently if you were to knit a piece, it's like saying, create the paper, now draw the visualization on top of it. Um, whereas if you can use a more hybrid approach, the knitting machine can make the paper for you and you just focus on where the data marks are. Um, so you're still critically thinking about the pattern, but when it comes to all of the background of the rest of the garment or the rest of the piece that's just knit stitches on top of knit stitches, the machine can take care of that. Yeah, um, yeah. I think that's a crucial point because if you automate the process completely, you lose the value. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also a commitment of time too, because mm -hmm. it's saying that it's important to you because I'm going to spend time doing it. If you just push a button and out pops the fully crocheted, the mm -hmm. fully woven visualization, it doesn't have the same power to you as an individual in terms of the learning experience. Mm -hmm. It's because you're detached from the actual process. Oh yeah. Action. Well, and, and it also anchors the artifact temporally in a moment. So um, with a lot of the, what I'm kind of curious about is with a lot of the temperature temperature blankets like this, you read people's posts and they talk about, oh, I had to catch up today. So it's not necessarily one day, one square. Oftentimes they're letting a week go by and then on the weekend they're knitting for you know seven days worth or 14 days worth. Um, but that means that when they return back to that garment, they can sort of spot, oh right, I did all of these in one session. So pieces of the object are actually attributed to a very specific point in time. Yeah, question. Um, that little sample that you passed by before, was that a test or did that have any data in It has no data it? and I was just noodling okay. around. Okay, because I was trying to turn around I'm like, what's, what's in to try and okay, So the, the swatch that I passed around has a couple different um, techniques that I sort of hid in there. So the most obvious are the bees, and this has to do with like data readability once again. Um, so asking, you know, how, how evident or obvious would data points be and how much of this might you be able to determine um, haptically. So if you were um, if you wanted to be able to feel where the data is, the beads might be easiest. The lace work might be the next easiest. Um, cabling has a really interesting uh, material effect where it actually adds tension to the piece because you've crossed the stitches. Um, but there's a couple cables in there, and then the purl stitches are probably the most subtle. They feel like mistakes. Um, but it's sort of interesting to think about these little mistakes that you could potentially also represent data. So no, this is, this is Laura experimenting with what happens if I randomly try adding um, like small lace holes versus cable stitches versus um, other techniques. But yes, the other thing I've noticed in noodling around has been finding appropriate data sets of things that, that I would like to represent has been sort of challenging, um, bizarrely enough, because that means like, right, I first have to, I can't just start knitting and, and go at it. It's like step one, find data that I want to represent in, in something like a swatch and then go for it. So if anyone has ideas of things that they would like to have knit or crocheted, let me know. Could you explain your idea or plan for organizing the miniature makerspace with mm. miniature? Yeah. Um, so a lot of things I've been thinking about. So I've been t chatting a bit with Yvonne, actually, Van Jensen, about this, because um, she's also a makerspace fabby kind of person. Um, a lot of it's been thinking about um, really thinks about, okay, if we, were to, if we were to look at this as an ecosystem and think about how we can um, leverage all of the data that's already flowing through this ecosystem, how can we visualize it in the space in ways that are immediately relevant to people? Um, consumable inventory actually might be a, the best example to give because I can use Sensalab as an example. Because Sensalab has a kick-ass inventory website um, and it has a really nice inventory system. It's a little abstract intentionally so, which I think is brilliant, and I kind of want to steal that idea because it's great. Um, it's intentionally hard to use, but at the same time, you can imagine like, okay, what if we embedded LEDs in each of the little pockets? So when you open a drawer, you can get a sense of which of them are running low, um, or you can get a sense of uh, which one are you looking for. I've selected it, now it lights up the right drawer I need to open. I open that drawer, it lights up the right place where I need to go. Um, or if what if there is a way that you know, when I'm logging into the, the inventory system, it starts lighting up all of the pieces that I've already used, so I have a sense of how much I've already taken from that system. Um, so there's different ways of thinking about just even within that inventory system. How do you improve the experience for the individual maker? How do you improve the experience for somebody who might be searching for expertise? Um, how do you improve the experience for somebody who might have to restock 
all the time, or someone who might have to yell at people for sitting on Arduinos and somebody else needs an Arduino, are you sure you're still using that Arduino? So things like that um, that can be useful. So a lot of it's been thinking about um, you know, rec recognizing that there's all of these sort of pragmatic questions that have to be dealt with. Can we use data to help, um, help make some of those processes more transparent, help support um, some of the things that the lab manager might otherwise do? Yeah. Combining that with ideas on what's in it, you could almost imagine because like each of us, like, you'd mentioned the idea before of looking at the in inventory to see who's used what mm -hmm. to figure out who's got experience in what area. You could almost knit something for people based on their experience. Like, you know, I tend to be the sewing guy, you know, then you'll have different people that like the printing people or that kind of thing. Like, uh, just a, idea. Um, well, and I've, I've thought about that with like, Special hats. well, I've yes. thought about like Girl Scout mm -hmm. sashes, you know, how you get badges. Like, a lot of people have done the like, oh, you get a badge for soldering or whatever. Um, I think it'd be, I think it'd be bonus cool if it was um, like, as you are trained on a machine, you then create your badge with that machine so it's very clear that you are the sewing guy because you sewed a thing that shows that you are the sewing guy. Um, or if you're the person who knows how to use the SLA machine then you can tell because you have an SLA badge that shows that you know how to use the SLA machine. But then there's still this, this design question of what's the most appropriate way to, um, to include that physicalization in our environment. Is that like, you know, you have like your belt kind of like a wrestling champion belt and you have like different medals on it. Um, is it like you have a chair koozie and you just pin them on your chair koozie for the back of your chair so it's easy to tell. So it's, it's interesting to think about how that might be integrated into the office environment too. You might want it to be discreet. Like you don't want people to know that you know how to use a particular thing unless you're in a particular area. So it might be like on your chair. Mm -hmm. say, or, or it's somehow, yeah. Maybe it's on your chair, so if you're sitting in your chair, no one can tell. But if you're not sit, if you're not around, they can tell. Yeah. This is going to lead to disappointment because you come on. Ah, oh, I thought he was here. I couldn't <laughs> have found out about. It. But <laughs> where'd you go? And then you yeah. See yeah. So, yeah. Any other questions? Obviously, we should chat because yeah. that's that's how this whole game works. So, um, Laura's around until October, mm -hmm. so I mean, she's here for a sabbatical. So, please chance to speak to her one-on-one -on -one about what everyone else here does. I know you've met most people. Yeah. Already, if anybody wants sourdough starter, let yeah. me know. I can hook <laughs> you up. We can have our own bakery set up here. We have tried a brewery in the past. That Ooh. Really well, but a bakery might be yeah. But uh, let's thank Laura once again for a great presentation. Thanks, Laura. Cool. Great.